that, James is going to introduce Dan. All right. Uh, this is uh, Dan Glass. He's the uh, CISO at American Airlines. He, you won't recognize him today uh, because he's wearing uh, his street clothes, but he is uh, quite handsome. And uh, here you go, Dan. <laughs> Thanks, I think. <coughs> All right, so I'm going to move the mic down so I can actually do this. I'm going to do it because I'm a rule breaker. I set rules. I make my own rules. Will that work? And then there's apparently a line here that if I cross, I get into a wormhole or something. So I have to be careful of that as well. All right. So you guys left me hanging here. Uh, go to go to your screen. Unless I mean I can just talk. That's fine too. I'll try and be quick. Yeah. All right. So as was introduced, all right. I am the. Chief Information Security Officer at American Airlines. Um, okay. So my apologies. There was a HDMI dongle up here on this. I'm just going to hold this. That's fine. Good morning. How are we doing? All right. So I know CISO at American Airlines sounds like a pretty cool and big job, but honestly, I just mostly look at spreadsheets. And when my staff makes me mad, I make them look at spreadsheets. <laughs> so American Airlines is pretty big. Um, and you can see, or maybe you can't. That's my desktop. Hold on. Can we? Oh, boy. Challenges. One second. Success. All right. So obviously, oh, is this pointing the right? Okay, anyway, we're just going to move on. Um, so we were founded in 1926. We have a lot of employees, 115,000 around the world. Uh, we have 950 aircraft. Uh, and just, I, I don't even want to pretend to know what that last number is. It's probably like 200 Googles or something of passenger miles flown every year. Uh, but there are 1,100 applications that we have internally that make that happen. Uh, and over 100,000 endpoints, mobile devices, laptops, computers, servers, et cetera, at over 400 of those locations globally. And we manage 400 to 500,000 accounts uh, at any given time. So there's a lot of magic that has to go into you being delayed by 10 minutes before you take off. <laughs> so. <laughs> if you're looking for a talk about, you know, some cool graphs, statistics, you know, things to take away, you're out of luck. Um, I think there's like five slides that aren't memes, and this is sort of one of them. So, um, but, you know, be thankful, because this, this is sort of how I am, and you just have to deal with me for 30 minutes. My staff has to deal with me for like 50 hours a week. Um, I broke this talk into three main chapters. First, I'm going to discuss our security strategy in American. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the enterprise challenges, and then finally opportunities and more challenges. So this isn't a, tool, a talk about tool chains or architectures or patterns of deployment, uh, which is good because that's a true story. I have no idea what I'm doing. You can't really read any of that. Okay. So <clears throat> this is a presentation on how to enable a philosophy 
of protection that is in conflict with the controls, processes, and funding, and culture that we have, right? Old company, 90 years old, so we have a lot of, of just stuff that's baked, you know, le hard lessons learned over time, and, you know, why we're all here breaks most of that. Um, we're not talking about transformation. This is going to be a hard-fought slog, uh, but at the same time, I have to maintain the old stuff. And there are some things that make the airlines a little unique, and we'll discuss some of them, but there's a lot of things that, as you are listening to me talk, you'll say, okay, yeah, nope, that's just a big company. So we're gonna talk about the security strategy and the path that we're, uh, we're taking to balance some of the new methods of deployment, once again, why we're here, uh, with the traditional ways of doing things. So, can you, yeah, okay, those work. I talk a lot, <coughs> to my peers across the verticals, you know, within airline industry and then throughout, you know, the Fortune 50, Fortune 100, Fortune 500. And the challenges of running a large IT organization aren't unique to American, obviously, <coughs> or to aviation in general. And if you work for a legacy company, large or small, you're going to recognize some of the things uh, that I'm about to talk about. Um, but that being said, before we can discuss strategy, we need to be able to deliver on one. So the first thing you need to do is staff up and you need talented resources that are dedicated and passionate about what they do, right? Whether it's security or development or administrative tasks, you just want people that want to come to work in the morning. And um, I mean, you know, we have clock punches too, but you want people that have a little bit of fire in their belly. So now I'll talk about the strategy a little bit. It focuses on the basics of defense. You guys are allowed to laugh, by the way. These are supposed to be funny, okay? I promise you, you know, I, I did not run this past my corp comm team. I promise you, yeah, <laughs> these slides were not cleared. So this focuses on the basics of defense and they don't depend on any architecture or process or technology. And it fits in nicely with the strategy, you know, or the control du jour or the threat du jour. I don't care about those things from a strategy perspective. I never have to respond or change my strategy based on APT. Right, because APT is already accounted for in what we do, or DevOps is art. In fact, you're gonna see this, the strategy I'm presenting is five years old and you're gonna see a lot of things that probably sound very familiar to what, what uh, we're here talking about. The, the words that you'll see are, were chosen very carefully because words matter, uh, action verbs, uh, uh, words that inspire. So everything in the airline has to have an acronym um, they don't let me have strategy or, or any sort of program or application without a, a acronym. So this one's ROAD, and it stands for, as you can see, Rugged Systems, Operational Excellence, Actionable Intelligence, and Defensible Platforms. And I'm going to go into each uh, briefly. I'm not going to talk very long about uh, this because uh, you, you're going to see, once again, this. you probably know most of this. <coughs> so we talk about Rugged Systems that can survive in hostile environments. The internet's a pretty hostile place if you've ever been on it. Um, we need to design systems from the ground up that are resilient to attack. They need to be adaptable to changes in environment and or geolocation and or hosting. And they need to be tested. Right? We, can't, we can't throw a product out there that hasn't been, that hasn't met, we, you know, we need to know what the bad guys need to see, I guess is what I'm getting at. <coughs> so what you need for that is an application security program, which has three main tenants or parts, I guess. So you need some secure coding standards, right? You have to tell the, you have to set the, the, you have to tell the developers what their expectations are or our expectations of them. Automated code testing, analysis, and reporting. Once again, I think you guys are very familiar with that. And then a big part is developer training, outreach, consulting, um, partnership, uh, getting with the developers and having them understand, you know, why we think what they do is important. Um, our contextual guidance is key. Uh, <coughs> we produce blueprints uh, so that application teams and architects can actually plug in parts of our security architecture into their applications so they don't have to try to figure out how to do enterprise authentication every time they write their app. They, they know they just write the word SiteMinder or Active Directory and, and they're good to go and they move on. So the big part of this is that we sell code quality which is fewer defects, you know, make, um, and we make our presence in their life as painless as possible, or we try to, um, because we want to be an ally, because then they'll come to us, and then we get better results from, secure, you know, from a security outcome perspective, <coughs> and that's actually you know, pretty important. So the next is operational excellence. Uh, 
once again, it, you know, the, the company's demands. So when I draw, does everybody familiar with the CIA of security, confidentiality, integrity, availability? So when I draw this on the whiteboard for newbies that come into the company, uh, you know, I write a little C, a little I, and then a huge A. Because you want to talk about the pressures of availability where a five minute outage may mean 20 cancellations and or, you know, people stuck at gates, missed bags, missed connections. So the stakes are high for us. So availability is key. So we need services that are reliable. They need to be sustainable and durable. And we need to do them fast, um, which you'll see is a challenge for us. You know, this is all about process. And whether it's centralized processes or federated processes, uh, manual or automated, it, it, this is really the blocking and tackling of how we run IT within security and then throughout the enterprise. Uh, this is boring but important and also very hard to fund, right, versus the stuff the business wants because they want, you know, faster and sexier and we just want to, you know, upgrade a server. Yes, we still have to upgrade servers. <coughs> Next is actionable intelligence. So there, obviously, we need to make quick decisions, especially when you know we've got a situation where potentially a critical system is, is seeing faults and we need to figure out why. Uh, we need correct data. It needs to be meaningful and it needs to be relevant to the situation at hand, not just relevant, or I mean, uh, not just meaningful, <coughs> excuse me. And this is all about visibility. Whether you're running a 24 by seven SOC or you're outsourcing it to a third party, it, it's being able to know what's going on. Right, and especially in the kind of environment I have to live in with lots of third parties, getting them to send us data is challenging. Uh, so, you know, we have dark spots on our network where we just hope that their, you know, their SOC engineer is as good as ours. Um, and uh, just a little quick story, it, hopefully it's funny, I don't know, it doesn't have to be. Um, but, <coughs> so I was explaining this specific point to my CIO, this was a few years ago, and I, I told her, you know, imagine our IT ecosystem, our network is like your kitchen in the middle of the night, and you walk in, and you, you know, you're, you hear a crunch. And before you turn the lights on, you know, if the lights aren't on, you don't know what you just stepped on. So you don't know if they're cockroaches or cornflakes. So what I want to do is flip the switch, and so you can see cockroaches or cornflakes. I didn't know that she does not like cockroaches at all. <laughs> and she wigged out, like, Wigged out, I lost her. After that, I mean, I still had like 30 minutes to present to her and she just kept, you know, like shuddering and, 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 and saying, I just can't get cockroaches out of my head. And I'm, <coughs> lesson learned, right? <laughs> so, so be careful with that one. Um, finally, defensible platforms. This is, you know, making sure systems are hardened, that they can survive against attack and, and that, that, the, uh, that they're effective defenses. And, uh, this is where security really got to start. This is, you know, this is our wheelhouse. We're good at this. Um, you know, this is firewalls and antivirus and all the other great stuff. Um, but obviously we need a framework around it so we make good decisions and they're consistent so we don't just, you know, the answer to everything isn't more firewalls. Uh, for a while it was, right, more firewalls. Um, but in reality, you know, we need to make sure that we're hitting all of the, the areas, right, network, platform, identity, access, et cetera. So lucky for me, uh, because we're a pretty regulated uh, industry, this aligns to NIST. If and if and uh, you know, I'm used to speaking to other security people, so you guys may not know what the NIST CSF is, Critical Cybersecurity Framework, um, for or for critical infrastructure. And uh, this, uh, you know, the strategy that we use at AA actually line for line. I mean, I go through and and we actually did this uh, for each one of those 97, I believe, or 98. Uh, areas of the NIST uh, framework, we actually lined out and said, is this a rugged initiative, is this an intelligence initiative, or uh, operational initiative, et cetera, uh, which is good because the FAA is gonna uh, you know, potentially start auditing us against this. So now we're gonna talk about uh, airline, right? And here's one of our earlier models. Um, does anybody know how long an, or an aircraft is in service typically? And how it's measured? Well, they're, they're in service for, they can be in service for over 30 years or, or longer. It all depends on what they call pressurization cycles as it goes up and comes down, pressurization cycles. So it's less about how old it is, but how many times it's been up at altitude. And, you know, they can last 25, 30 years easily. And then after that, they're usually, you know, so American uh, will sell their, um, their aircraft to like a FedEx or something. And then when they're done, they'll send it to, you know, Eastern Europe or Africa. So these planes last a long time. And so they're still 
you know, like 717s and, and 707s still flying around the world, right? And here's the inside view of one of our cockpits. I'm so glad. I showed this to my staff and they're all young and nobody got it. Like they, <laughs> they didn't know what this was. So I'm glad that you guys are old like me. <coughs> so we, we update IT systems on our planes quite often and they can be replaced uh, as they get old, but man, that is expensive. Um, it's really a great cost to the airline to have to replace any sort of component on the aircraft fleet wide. And so that way design issues uh, and anything that requires modification of hardware or firmware is very problematic. Uh, so measure twice, cut once is a big deal. Um, we have manual processes to deploy software currently. Uh, mechanics actually go out, uh, flight engineers, and they will get on the airplane and we have separation of duties, integrity checks, and, and then obviously the physical access component in order to actually touch the aircraft and separation duties is like I need a guy in the cockpit, like literally guy at the cockpit, guy in the back of the plane and somebody on the ground in front of a computer reading a code out in order to put it in what's known as maintenance mode. So the guy who said that he can like, you know, move one engine, not the other, no. Um, and the concept of safety is ingrained deep into these processes, right? W security is sort of a new concept, uh, you know, within the last 20 years or so, but safety's been around since, you know, 1929, uh, you know, obviously, because it's a great cost and risk to the airline. So the processes dictate the flow, though, and so that, and that's important. So you understand that as fast as IT can produce software, uh, we're still, you know, we have a, a major constraint and I'm not so sure that that constraint's a bad thing. In some cases, we'll talk a little bit about that. So, uh, because flow is necessary and sometimes even desired, the concept of fail fast doesn't really work when you're sitting on board one of our aircraft. So, I fly too. Um, it's incredibly expensive for the airline to make changes to the aircraft, and um, as I mentioned, so for example, if we want to update something like a, a certificate revocation list or, or changing the route certificate, you know, the accepted route chain on an aircraft, we actually have to pull all those aircraft in and those mechanics have to do what they do. Well, so it, when it's anticipated, that's fine. When you plan it out and you schedule with uh, flight ops and you schedule with fleet service or uh, fleet group, no problem, right? But if you do it and you go, in, oops, and let's say you, you know, lose your route certificate or your, you know, intermediary signing certificate, you've got to pull all those planes in pretty quick, right? Because the next time that aircraft asks for its CRL list and it doesn't get one, you may have, you know, the avionics will probably still work, but it may not be able to make coffee. Um, and I'm not kidding, there is actually software to run the coffee pot. And so, we, but you can see how expensive that would be to the airline, right? Not just the expense of pulling the aircraft and the mechanics working, but you know, we gotta cancel flights or we gotta move the fleet around, we gotta juggle because every aircraft has specific requirements and needs and not everyone can go international, not everything can do a long haul across the continental US, et cetera. So, you know, measure twice, cut once, big deal. So we're gonna talk a little bit about Enterprise. This is not one of our aircraft, <laughs> although we're, well, that would be cool. Okay, so <coughs> smokestacks. IT groups within American and within other companies align directly to a business vertical, right? So the business vertical has a requirement, the IT group meets that requirement with software, application, system, whatever. This creates those smokestacks, as, uh, not as you see here, but you know, it creates a virtual smoke, you know, the silos that we talked about. And it's efficient, believe it or not, right? So I know we want to talk about breaking down the silos, in some cases, we do want to break down the silos, but in our case, you know, some of those silos exist for a reason, and they happen naturally. And if we break them down, I promise you, within five years, they're going to rebuild themselves because the needs of the Advantage Group with AA.com is a whole lot different than the, the tech ops requirement uh, for our m &E group, right? Or our, our revenue planning needs things from the revenue group. Uh, so completely different systems, completely different mindset, completely different customer base even, and, and so, it's not necessarily bad, but I still have to work within it. So one of the biggest downfalls of this is information that gets trapped in those silos. So let's say we have a group that is doing, you know, flight service, and they have some really, you know, they're doing DevOps and they're using, you know, Pivotal and, and Puppet to go achieve awesome things. And we have other groups in the company that are also trying to do great things, but they don't, they don't have that knowledge. And so we have to recreate the wheel. And so. You know, I, I, I smile sometimes when I hear about, you know, well, we have to standardize on this, you know, tool chain versus this tool chain. I'm like, yeah, maybe, 
or maybe we just do them all and we just figure out, okay, how does security plug in? How does enterprise plug in? How does network plug in? And over time, a winner may emerge or may not, but to dictate something up front may not be the best choice for, for an airline like American. So I know Brooklyn thinks it's got the corner, uh, market cornered on Hipster. I think Austin also probably wants to vie for that. But <coughs> man, we were building artisanal, local, organic, silicon-based systems that are handcrafted with love for each and every one of our deployments. So if you guys want, artisanal services come to American Airlines, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Even with security baselines and configuration standards, once we release a server into production and the app team gets their hands on it, still, you know, then the love comes in and, and we hug them. And virtualization and cloud were supposed to fix all this, but, you know, we bring old processes and I'll talk a little bit about that later, but, you know, the raw capabilities doesn't mean the good out outcome or, or the great output, right? So what we were doing was just, instead of you know, putting stuff, something on an HP uh, DL server that's physically located in one of our data centers, now we were putting the exact same configure, you know, the exact same thing just in AWS. <coughs> so we have literally thousands of systems, subsystems, and processes that run an airline every day to day. And PNR, by the way, is your ticket, right? It's, your, it's that number that you have on your ticket. So that, that is your itinerary. So somebody that makes a change to the PNR service that's in our SOA uh, hub Big deal, right? And you know, once again, measure twice, cut once. So <clears throat> they have high levels of dependence, and like I said, thousands of them. They don't all talk to each other. They don't all depend on each other, but a lot of them have those those that brittleness. Um, you know, we hard code parameters, or we used to hard code parameters like IP addresses. I mean, oh my goodness, you want to talk about something you can't move? Hard code an IP address, and then compile it, and then lose your source code over ten years, and the person that wrote it is like long gone, like literally long gone like not with us anymore <coughs> and you know and now you're back to square one you you know you you can't just upgrade it you can't just migrate it you have to literally recreate that application with the same business outcome from scratch so don't touch anything is also sort of a thing we say <laughs> you know we have freeze periods and they last a long time and they're very strict and it takes a lot to actually get something pushed into production sometimes because of this so then we also have legacy. So this is not a meme. This is either little. This is literally the American Airlines reservation system from um, the 1960s. Um, our core airline systems predate TCP/IP. They predate Nixon as president of the United States. Written in COBOL and other you know, JCL, and those languages are still used. Um, we still have teletype. Take that in for a minute, right? You guys are talking about Slack, right? <laughs> we got teletype, yo. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean it's insecure or bad. It just means it's slow and we're kind of stuck with some, you know, we have to do certain things a certain way because we have, uh, you know, uh, travel agencies in South America that want to use teletype. They don't want to move away from it. And we don't want to say no to people that want to fly with us. So. We, you know, we have to maintain those, those legacy systems. So, <laughs> none of this that I'm talking about makes us inherently insecure or unstable, but in, and in some limited cases, like as I mentioned, this can actually make us better. Um, that we, you know, errors are eliminated before it gets to production because we have lots of people looking at it and we go through lots, you know, we have like, you know, 18 different environments you have to go through, um, but it makes us slow. Right, it makes us, you know, the pivot is more of, you know, a slow motion turn like in, in the matrix or something um, where, you know, we have a good idea and then it takes us two years to get anywhere. So, but th that being said, we're ready to take the red pill at American. We have already begun to take the red pill. Um, so, and, and within security, I can say that, you know, like immutable infrastructure is freaking awesome, right? That's like a dream come true for me. Um, automated scanning. It's sweet, right, bitchin'? But, you know, and nobody gets interactive access to fraud, where do I sign up? Seriously, like, like well, here, right? <laughs> Over there, I guess. Um, but, but we still have lots of, uh, we'll call them opportunities in InfoSec. Um, so the automated configuration, testing, deployment will help the airline to get, you know, we'll get stuff out there faster for like .com and maybe some core like flight systems. Um, but we still have those long lead times and uh, lots of work in progress because of the legacy operational processes 
tightly coupled systems and you know bottlenecks everywhere, right? In some cases, they're procedurally mandated bottlenecks. We have to have a bottleneck because the FAA has to come inspect us or the TSA or, or whoever we have to deal with that day. And so an application team also, and this, this, is, this is real, right? We, we may have 500 developers working on something, but that one build manager goes on vacation for a couple weeks, stops. This is also tough for, for me to explain to my team and to other teams within American, right? The, the, the new way of doing things, lean and agile and DevOps. And we've been doing agile at American, but sort of, you know, we call it agile at American. So we created our own version of agile, right? Because we know better than everybody else. Um, so I've started to, to have these conversations and others within the company that are, are sort of the, you know, the, the vanguard on this have started to have these conversations talking about the Toyota lean manufacturing method, but not everybody's gonna read two to three books a month and you know, I've got like 30 minutes with them and I'm, you know, I'm trying to, to handle this stuff out. So, and, you know, so DevOps, when, although I say it to them, it's just a buzzword right now because if you really don't understand lean and you don't understand agile, then DevOps is doomed to fail, right? Because we're just gonna layer in our old operational processes and our old way of doing things on a cool tool chain and you know, so what happens if I just put 18 you know, toll gates in there? There's not one release manager, there's a security release manager, and then there's gonna be the infrastructure release manager, and the operations release manager, and the application release manager, and you know, so on and so forth, right? And then so at the end of the day, uh, DevOps really doesn't buy us anything either. So you know, this is where you know, I started my journey, and some of you may have started your journey here as well. Uh, you know, you wanna cry as you're reading the first half of that book. Uh, because you're like, oh my God, this, how did they know? It's me. <laughs> I'm Bill. And I'm John. Oh, the security guy, right? Yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, no, I've got like five Brits. So, yeah. Um, do you, no, you don't. Um, so, obviously, this requires leadership. So, th this book, we've, we've actually handed it out to all of our leadership in IT at this point. And so, we're, we're making headways so we can have at least a common conversation. Right, so you know, even though some of them got through the first half and they said that, well, it just was too stressful, I had to put it away. <laughs> well, literally, like, some of them said I couldn't finish it. I'm like, well, but that's when it gets good. That's, they solved the problem eventually. And no, you know, like, okay, well, just tell me about it. <laughs> so <laughs> so to, to, dr to drive that point home um, and, and give, give y'all some perspective about where I'm at, I don't know if you read this, but Netflix recently shared that they finally migrated 100% of their legacy operations to AWS. They're 100% cloud at this point. They have nothing in a data center, right? They just have their laptops and they have the cloud. It took them seven years to get there. And I have no doubt that they could have done it sooner if they weren't focused on growth and business model and improving their product. Um, but, and, and, but most IT organizations don't have the dedicated focus and the will and the commitment and the flexibility to do what Netflix can do, which is that all-in cloud approach, right? Most companies can't just say, we're, we're gonna go all cloud. So if it took Netflix seven years, how long is it gonna take us, right? And how long is it gonna take some of you know, the large companies that are probably sitting here? So we'll have pockets of success, but this is really a core fundamental change that needs to, to occur. So the challenge is that we wanna enable and encourage the DevOps culture, processes, and tools, but we have to maintain and improve on our legacy protection and processes. We have to adapt to these emerging threats, right? So I have to deal with those things. Um, and I have to keep the costs in check, right? I get a big budget, but it's not that big and it, it can't expand forever and ever. So basically I want magic, but I believe in magic. Oh, aw, <laughs> yay. Okay, so this, this had a dirty word in it and I did redact that. So, so we wanna embrace DevOps, but we wanna make sure that we give legacy a, a squeeze, right? So, so we want to make sure, once again, and I'm repeating the same thing several times because they are important. We can't just you know, have our shiny objects and then forget about the old stuff because the old stuff is gonna sit there and we're actually creating, you know, so we're solving one set of problems over here, but creating a whole new set of problems or repeating the mistakes of the past uh, somewhere else. So obviously we wanna automate what we can, but we need solid processes for the rest. Um, personally, I'm encouraging automation, um, but I understand that a lot of people within my organization, within American as a whole, see automation as a threat to their livelihood, right? 
because we have a lot of people who take paper, you know, virtual, take paper from one side of their desk and they move it to the other side of their desk, right? And there's value in that, right? We have to move the paper. The paper must be moved and they have to do a checkbox or make sure that the paper is correct before it's moved, right? But automation removes that. And so we know that they're going to have jobs, right? I can tell them, you know, we're going to automate this function and we're going to give you something better to do. Right, we're gonna we're gonna send you to some training, and you're gonna do something amazing because there's no way you know we have too much to do already. So even if e even if we automated like all of our processes, I still need the staff that I have, right? Because there's that much left off the table that we're not getting done. And but but once again, change is hard for some people, and they don't want to, right? They like moving paper. They got really good at it, right? They can get all you know their 40 hours of of work done in like 10, and you know there's lots of Facebook time. So automated controls increase security, accountability, and consistency. And so, so you know, the point here is that certain processes and controls can be shed, right? I will turn off, you know, because for a long time they were saying, well, you know, what are you doing today, you know, with this new thing? What can you shut off? And I'm like, nothing, right? Because the attackers don't stop the old crap, right? I mean, you know, so, you know, my CIO read an article one time about antivirus being, you know, dead. And I'm like, okay. So I'll pull it off of all of our desktops and we'll see how quick we come to a stop because, you know, the stuff's still out there. Slammer's still out there. Code Red is still out there and it's infecting, you know, boxes. Now they're all in South America and Asia, but still it's out there. So you remove antivirus, you're still, you're removing something you probably actually still need. So, but with DevOps, you know, all of a sudden it's not a problem anymore because I just click a button and refresh the, the you know, if I get infected in, on a production server or, or um, I guess on a production server is what I care about most, so we'll stay with that. You know, we click a button and five minutes, you know, we shut it down and bring it back up. There's really no impact to the operations, but currently we can't do that. So I still have antivirus. I still have pattern files. So it, the tool chain also increases visibility, right, from my perspective. And, and once again, you know, you guys are teaching me this, so I'm like a little embarrassed I'm up here telling you. Um, but <coughs> the visibility that we get from, from this tool chain and the monitor, the increases in monitoring, uh, can we can jump on those problems really quickly now, right? So most of the time when we see stuff like this, the DNS type requests or ARP, you know, it's it's not a, it's not malware, it's not some bad guy. It's typically somebody went oops, right? The hand, you know, sometimes handcrafted with love have threads loose. But <coughs> I have compliance worries, right? So I. I can explain rugged DevOps and DevSecOps to a QSA or an auditor, and they're going to nod their head eventually, right? After the hour-long meeting, they're going to, they're going to, you know, be on board. They're going to get it, right? You can see that that something just, you know, ding, you know, they, they had that moment of clarity. I'm winning, and then they'll say, but PSI, you know, PCI, you know, Q.3.4 clearly states you must, and you know, oh, come on, man, we're trying to make things better. This is better, and it doesn't matter because I have to maintain, right? I have to be compliant. And sometimes that means we have to do the wrong thing. So that's, that's my fight. Um, but, um, and I'll ask you guys to help me later. <coughs> so, and once again, this is another one where I showed this and nobody knew what the hell I was <laughs> talking about. Like, like why is he showing what that's, what is, um, so tooling enables process, process enables culture. Right, and, and then culture, the cycle repeats. And, but you need all three, right? So if you just come out with the tool chain, which is where most people wanna start, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna fail, right? Once again, you're gonna put your old culture in place. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. <coughs> so I'm gonna talk about when we first deployed uh, to cloud in 2010. Um, so I was actually on the Vanguard. I was an architect back then, and I was pushing for it because once again, I saw the future. I saw you know mutable infrastructure. I saw you know no access to to uh, production. I saw uh, host-based firewalls. Right. I, I saw this. I saw this as a good thing for us because it gets us out of this legacy. You know the system can't be moved type of mindset. But and and, and I brought good thing. You know I d I went and got uh, deep security. You know or, or you know the se uh, for, uh, seventh brigade uh, deep security and and a cloud encryption program that, you know, which now is, yeah, anyway, this was in 2010, you gotta excuse it. It was bad, but it, it was better than what we had. So we were wanting to innovate in security, but the problem is, is we layered in a manual process in order to get those firewalls configured, and we layered in a manual process to create the encryption keys. 
So therefore, we ended up with cloud, but we really created another data center. So I had my Tulsa data center replicated in an Amazon data center. That was great, except it took six weeks to get a server from initial idea to something, you know, or, or initial dev through to production, right? Now you guys are doing it like in six minutes. And we're still doing it in, you know, we're a little better now, it's like three weeks. But, um, so this lesson stuck hard with me as we approach DevOps, that I can't repeat the mistakes of the past, that the culture is super important on this one, the processes are super important, and the tooling will almost take care of itself if you get those first two things nailed. And <clears throat> so this is where we trust but verify. So we want to enable development engineering operators to do their jobs quickly without security interference, but we need to put in checks to, place, uh, to make sure security isn't skipped. And make it okay to push to fraud without the security check. Don't make us a toll gate, but, but instead give us an alert saying somebody just did something that was against the rules. If they do skip informally and, you know, just walk up to them and say, what's going on, right? Because most likely they skip because your, pro your process or your tool or whatever you're using sucks. Right, and that's why they start to go around you because because the security tool isn't good. And right? once again, I'm not talking to a group of security people, but you know when I do give you know when I do give this type of talk to security people, I'm saying they bypass us because we're bad. They don't bypass us because they don't want to be secure. So that leads to the building the partnerships. Right, security isn't just security's problem. I can't solve everybody's problem for them, and I certainly can't build a team large enough to be everywhere at once. So we need to work between the silos but the, the stovepipes aren't gonna break down, so I just have to live in them. Um, understand their motivations and, well, I'm trying to understand your motivations and pressures. I should, you know, like I said, this was meant for other three tips. Um, but <coughs> motivations and, uh, and pressures haven't, uh, they've actually increased, right? Because now, you know, your CIOs are reading this and your CEOs are reading this, you know, the DevOps stuff, not the mine. Um, and, and they're saying, well, I want to go to cloud, I want to go faster, I want to go faster, I want to go faster, and go, okay, we're going to go faster, but if security's not on board, then once again, somebody somewhere is going to say, well, we're breaking PCI, or we're breaking FISMA, or we're breaking something, and we have to pull this back, and we need more governance, and we need somebody to click a button to say, I approve this. And by the way, I'm only going to put two people on that staff, even though we have like 40 app teams. So, but, but, we need to be transparent and open. We need to talk about our pressures and our motivations. Instead of just saying no, it's not the way you just said because this is why. And we don't normally have those conversations or when we do it's in some sort of yelling mode where everybody's already pissed off at each other. So we need to make sure that we, you know, because we share the same goal. I'm, you know, I sit across from my, the director of, of infrastructure and me and him want the same thing at the end of the day. We want to make American Airlines a lot of money right, and we want to serve our passengers well and we don't want disruption. So here's my request of you guys. Understand that your security team has a sit <laughs> those different sets of, of pressures and goals. Like, like this is real, like, you know, I, uh, it could be. I mean, I've been to London, I mean, it looks vaguely familiar, but that, you know, OpenStack could be that way, I don't know. Um, explain what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how there's mutual benefit. Right? There's a lot of mutual benefit in what you guys are doing, and if your security team isn't on board or not understanding it, explain it to them, right? Like, you know, we, we, the tribe, bring them in. They're, they're not the enemy, I promise. And be patient with us, because we're used to being hit upon the head, right? I mean, we've been beat up for, you know, 20 plus years in enterprises, so, you know, be slow, bring out the sock puppets and the crayons, um, talk slowly, calmly, no sudden moves, exactly. Thank you. <coughs> and, I and I hope this talk wasn't a waste of your time. I hope you got something out of it. And uh, please let me know if you have any questions after. Thanks.